Thanks for being here with us this evening. I'm Jinchi, and together with my team, Charles, Vikram, and Vinod, we welcome you to Troublemakers Assembly, organized by the Design School at Taylor's University. This is our fourth e-conference for this year's Troublemakers Assembly series. To all Taylor staff, there are two registrations you have to do, okay? One is in HRSS, if you have not already done so. And the other is to register your attendance here. For that, we will provide the link in the live feed towards the end of the session. Now, remember, this attendance registration is only for Taylor staff, not Taylor students, okay? So for other university staff and students whose institutions require proof of attendance, you may write to us. Troublemakers Assembly is, an, is a gathering to honour and learn from the inspirational work done by an array of engaging personalities who have, in their own unique ways, made a mark in society through creative problem solving. This series of e-conferences aim at creating audience immersion through an active and meaningful content with the end objective of inspiring the audience to become their very own change makers. There is a survey we have prepared for you so we can get your suggestions for future improvement. The survey link will be provided in the feed after the talk. Don't forget to like and share our live feed, okay? So um, now let me introduce to you our speaker for the month, Mr. Mutu Nedumaran a software engineer and a typeface designer for over 30 years. He has experience in designing typefaces. He has produced fonts for a dozen scripts used to write languages across South Asia and Southeast Asia regions. The title of his presentation this evening is Creating Trouble with Strokes. Before I pass the session over to the speaker, I encourage everyone to post at least one question for Mutu in our live feed during or towards the end of his presentation, as we would love to hear from every one of you. Thank you. Let us now welcome Mutu. Thank you. Thank you, Dinshi, for the introduction. It's very, um, I'm very happy to be here at the Troublemakers Assembly. I was there for your last year's uh, Troublemakers Manifesto. Um, a lot, 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 had lots of fun. So let me uh, go straight into. Uh, how uh, much trouble I created with strokes <laughs> today. See, I was born in an island and in an estate where uh, it was filled with almost everybody in the estate were rubber tappers. It was a community that was brought to Malaysia by the British. Uh, my parents were second generation in, in the island. And if everybody spoke only one language, Tamil. And when I went to school, the teachers in the school didn't want to uh, take me in because I was correcting mistakes that they were making on the board. Because my dad was a Tamil school teacher, so he taught me Tamil you know, when I was a very young kid. So he had to send me to a, a school in the mainland, uh, and I went to an English medium school. And for the first time, I heard people speaking something I didn't understand. I had no idea there was such a thing as a language that people speak, because I grew up in an island where everybody spoke Tamil and only Tamil. There were no, I mean, I saw people with different color skins. That was, that was like a, <clears throat> that was like a shock um, uh, discovery for me. I don't know if, how many of you have watched the movie called Planet of the Apes, um, not the new ones, the old ones, um, where the apes spoke and, you know, when the, when the humans uh, recognized that they spoke and they said, where did you learn to speak English? And the apes said, what English? We don't know what you mean by English. We just speak. So that's why that's how I spoke when I was a kid. When I heard people speaking something else, I was I was very intrigued, and that's probably where my love for languages started. I was too small for me to understand what passion is all about, but you know I became interested in English. Um, I became top scorer for Malay English in my class, uh, Malay for my whole school, even for my whole whole standard. Now talking about languages, there are like Six six thousand eight hundred languages in the world today. This is all data from UNESCO, right? Eleven of them, eleven of these languages have more than a million, a hundred million mother tongue speakers. That includes English, Mandarin, Hindi, Arabic, and all that languages. 
There are 11 of those. About 200 languages account for about half the world's population, right? So half the world's population speak about 200 different languages. And over 6,000 of these languages, of spoken languages, they only have about 1,000 or, 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 or less speakers, right? So what's happening to all these um, languages, particularly the ones that are uh, spoken by less than a million people, right? This is what happens, you know? When, when you have a major language in the land and you speak a smaller, you belong to a community that speaks a smaller language, you tend to assimilate. Um, justification is usually like you're too small a population, we cannot book, produce books for you, we cannot build schools for you, we cannot have lessons for you. Um, the majority is the direction you should be following. That's, you know, that that's, uh, provides us economic of scale. Uh, you're economically poor to build your own school, so you're dependent on um, the providers to give you all those facilities. Um, very low resource base, there are not people, enough people doing research and doing things to promote the use of those languages. There's no political voice and you know, many of them are socially marginalized. What happens to these languages? You know, first of all, because your script is not um, universally, universally usable across many areas, uh, digital devices, uh, print media, for example, um, you start writing a language in another, in another script. You know, in many cases in Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of those minority languages have now adopted the uh, Latin script. You know, Tagalog has lost its script. A lot of the Indonesian uh, languages have lost their scripts. Vietnamese had its own script. It was all, it's lost and it's, it's now using a Latin-based script. So if you lose your script, you sometimes also lose a language. And along with that, you lose the literature, you lose the culture, and you lose the history of, of the entire community, um, and um, along with that, the identity. So I felt for this. You know, I, I had a lot of feelings for uh, people who spoke um, minority languages, and my mission was to enable them to use, to write and communicate in their own languages using their native scripts. And by virtue of the fact that I'm an engineer, uh, digital devices were natural uh, choice for me to enable these languages, enable the use of these languages. Um, so people will, found, will find them useful, people will find new usage um, for the languages, and that will probably slow um, the uh, 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 extinction. So many people have asked me in the past, especially when I used to work for corporate companies like Oracle and you know, other big uh, institutions, and they used to ask me, why are you doing all these weird languages? You know, there are many people, in fact, most people you speak to already understand English. Why do you need this? And at that time, I had a spontaneous answer for them. I said, well, what if your girlfriend tells you or your wife tells you that she loves you through somebody else? You still understand, right? You still get the communication. You still get the message. But will it feel the same, right? So he says, that's where the difference is. You know, if I want to read a literature written by someone uh, who spoke my language a thousand years ago, it makes a big difference when I read it natively in my script than to read a translation of that, um, you know, which is, a, which is communicated through the understanding of somebody else. So that's where I started, right? Um, so in this talk, I'll probably talk about some of the work. I mean, it's a very long journey. All this started in, uh, you know, ever since I was in school, there were lots of fights, a lot of wars, a lot of troubles that I made. Um, but, I, you know, given the shortage of time, I'll focus on um, a few things, a few initiatives that I um, took um, in bringing these scripts or languages, usage of these languages in, in mobile uh, devices. Um, the, the most recent, um, and the whole work started in, you know, as I said, when I was in school, that was in uh, the late 70s or early 80s. Um, but one of the major breakthroughs happened when I uh, quit my job and started focusing on my passion and trying to see if there's something I can do to make a difference in this world. And the first initiative was in uh, the year 2005 um, when I 
uh, worked with a Singapore radio station to launch an SMS service in Tamil. Um, people who are used to smartphones today may not understand, uh, appreciate the value of this. This is 2005, there was no smartphones, there was no iPhone, there was no Android. Um, uh, the, the best phone you can buy is probably a Nokia or Sony Ericsson with nine keys on them uh, and a small screen. Well, that's all you can see. So I made Tamil work on those devices. They don't come with support for native, native languages. Um, they support English, they probably support Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Um, at most in Southeast Asia, they probably support Thai because in Thailand, people don't speak English. So I made Tamil work in there. Um, you know, with a lot of support, a lot of work, a lot of hacking, um, and then made it into a product and with the support of, an, of a telecom uh, operator in Singapore and, and, and a radio station, we launched the world's first um, Tamil SMS service where people will be able to text to, with each other in Tamil and also text to the radio station in Tamil requesting for music, requesting for stuff like that. That was a big hit. The hall was like overflowing. People didn't have enough space to uh, come inside. I was shocked that people were interested in doing this. So that actually answered questions from my colleagues who asked you, why do you want to do all these weird languages? There are people who are interested. And then um, they, they had lots of difficulties doing that because we were probably ahead of technology at the time. Uh, it was not easy as you downloading an app on Google Play or Apple Store today. It was like people you need to get what you call a push and then you open the push and then they need to download. It's, it's a process. So to help them out, the radio station announced that, OK, uh, Mutu will be here, here, and here on the following day. If you have difficulties, go to him and ask him. So I go there like 15 minutes before time, and there was a huge crowd waiting for me. Right? These are people who worked in shipyards, who worked in restaurants. These are laborers from India. Um, they all don't speak English or any other language for the matter. They only spoke Tamil. And they're all waiting for me to help them because they don't know how, they don't understand all these brochures that were all in English. So while helping one guy, the first guy who was in queue said, I, I'm here for, I came here 45 minutes ago. I said, why do you come so early? He said, I want to make sure that I see you. And while I was helping him uh, downloading, uh, uh, helping him download the app or the, the, the applet, the midlet we called it at the time, on, on his tiny little Samsung C100, I still remember the device model. I was, uh, he was like going on and on and on and how uh, to, show, to tell me how happy he was that he was able to communicate with his wife. And I said, well, um, there are a lot of calling cards that are available today. You can call your wife anytime you want. It's not very expensive. You can call her for breakfast, you can call her for lunch and all that. But why is this so important? And that's when he told me that, well, my wife cannot speak. She's mute. And now I can, and she doesn't speak English either. And now she can communicate with me and we can talk to each other through this text message. Now I was touched. I felt like the purpose of this whole thing was achieved. Um, and then, of course, I would go on and launch the same thing in Malaysia. Cellcom did a big service where people were able to download jokes in Tamil. They will be able to download beauty tips in Tamil. I can share some of those with you if you want to hear. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, they could share some literary lines in Tamil, some quotations in Tamil. Um, lots of those stuff uh, uh, came about because there was a platform available. So all these hidden gems that people were not able to do or share become possible. Um, then we went on to other countries, went on to India, uh, launched with their mobile operators. Um, and, you know, we had the same question. Some people asked, hey, why do you want to give us trouble? You know, we were all going happy. You know, people are already using SMS in English. And why do you want to do all this? I said, well, there's a huge percentage of people out there who don't use English. Why don't you do this for them? And then, and then they saw the results. And, um, well, there was a technological barrier because um, it, the, the, the usage of language on these devices was an afterthought. Um, it was not like a native uh, support. But, you know, it's a start. At least it got people moving. At least it got the idea um, uh, propagated among um, uh, technology providers as well as users. Um, then we went to uh, Maldives, where there are about what, 300,000 people who speak a language called the Vehi, um, written in another unique script called Tana. They too lost their script. They had another script before, but you know, um, once they uh, became a Muslim nation, they started adopting Arabic numerals as their uh, 
as the letters. And we launched uh, an SMS service there too. I, I think you probably see a, a image on the slide that shows how people type uh, Tana using a Nokia device um, to get the script on their on their phone. Then, and then since we did something on uh, Tana is written uh, right to left like Arabic, and so, since we did Tana, which is a, which was written right to left, it's hey, why don't we do Jawi? That's our country's language. Right? Then we did Jawi, and um, Saka was so excited about this. Hey, let's do this. And while doing this, we met up with a few people, um, you know, uh, who are producing literature in Jawi. Very few people. And uh, one of them got so intrigued with this, and when, when, she, when you saw the way we typed uh, uh, Jawi, we, we just type in Rumi. We just type like Saya, and comes out as Simalibya in, in Jawi. And he was so excited, and he said, hey, who is the Muhammad who did all this? I don't see him here. You are here. I said, well, I'm a Muttu and I'm able to do it. <laughs> I do have Muhammad who are helping me, but you know, I'm, I don't need a Muhammad just to learn how to do Jawi. I can do it. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun uh, engaging with those people. I mean, they were so supportive and they were, they, we had a lot of fun exchanges with them. Um, then we went on to the Middle East and added more languages like Hindi, Malayalam, uh, Sinhalese, uh, uh, Bengali, and uh, some other languages. And we launched um, another service with a, um, uh, what do you call, a radio service there, <clears throat> and where people can um, text them, you know, similar to what we did in Singapore, we launched a radio service in uh, the Middle East where people can SMS to the station in, in any of those languages. And what was interesting was one of the DJs told me that they've they received messages that they've never received or seen before in their lives. People were sending poetry in those languages. One guy even wrote how to, you know, a, a guide on how to go marketing. How do you buy a coconut? How do you buy a, uh, an onion? How do you check um, if, a, a, if, an, if a, a vegetable is fresh? All this in poetry and you know, his own composition. So it, there was a lot of fun in the radio station, a lot of. Um, interesting messages like this. Well, all this was the time of um, uh, feature phones, where you know it was not it was not smartphones. They had like the twelve keys on the on the keypad and a small tiny screen. And there was a lot of challenges um, in, in two fronts. One, designing these characters for the small screen, because the languages that we talk about have they've, they've got a very high stroke density. A lot of strokes. Um, required to produce or to draw a character, unlike in English, where you can have a T with two strokes, A with three strokes and stuff, but this will have like many curves, many strokes, many lines that go across each other. It was a big challenge in doing that in a, for a small screen. Second was to design a keypad, a keyboard that they can actually type with the 12 keys. And some of these languages need more than that. So that was a lot of design challenges and, and we overcome them. But all of this disappeared with the introduction of smartphones, because you had a full screen where you can actually put the entire keyboard on the screen, and you don't need to show them English letters. They can type in their own language um, using their own script with the, with the visual keyboard. And that's the time I did uh, about a dozen languages, including Myanmar, Myanmar Khmer, Lao, uh, and other Indian languages. And we had an interesting experience when my family did. A, we did a holiday in about things. It was 2010 or 11. Um, we were in CM Rev looking at all the ruin temples uh, in Cambodia, and our driver, who spoke broken English, but he, he was texting to his friend um, in Khmer on an iPhone. And I, and I asked him very <laughs> uh, interestingly, is this, are you typing in Khmer? I said, yeah, and he was showing off to me how excited he was to type in Khmer. But I did not tell him that the font that was showing on the on the device was mine. <laughs> and my family was, you know, we shared our joke in, in Tamil and we had a good laugh. And um, it was really fun seeing that. Now, uh, that's that's a, a very short, a brief journey. Today, I'm working on some of the some of the scripts that are nearing extinction. You know, Grantha, for example, it actually fell out of use uh, a few years ago, about 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I've produced a font for Grantha. I'm hoping to see it. Uh, in a uh, popular mobile device uh, pretty soon. It's probably, it's in beta test stage right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm also working with a few people uh, trying to understand the Trihuta uh, script that's also uh, gone out of use. We're trying to bring it back. The people are trying to learn the script 
teaching people or, or WhatsApp on how to write that script. I'm also talking to Dr. Philip on, in Sarawak, whose contact I got to know through Taylor's College on uh, bringing the Iban language to the to digital devices so they can actually text in Gmail. I was actually um, uh, pleasantly surpri surprised to know that Iban had its own script. Um, so we're trying to see how we can bring it uh, to digital devices. And you know, this all these initiatives will help people uh, help these scripts uh, from becoming extinct. And um, now that most devices are already uh, language enabled, there's a business case to enable these languages because English is already like saturated. So um, companies are trying to uh, build more markets using uh, uh, going after people who don't speak English. So you have devices that are fully localized in all these languages. So in a, in a sense, that um, goal is pretty much, uh, is achieved. The next mission is to make sure that this is used. So we are trying to target little kids to learn languages, you know, whether it's your mother tongue or whatever language that is in their environment. Um, and you are trying to make little books for kids, digital books, um, with all the, the modern technologies that you can think of, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's augmented reality, uh, 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 text to speech, uh, handwritten recognition, whatever technologies that. Uh, required to make these books um, with a partner of mine who actually told me that we need a thousand mutus more uh, so we can you know get these things going. Um, so that's that's a brief uh, a short uh, story of uh, my the, the troubles that I that I created with strokes. Um, I'm still creating it. That's my passion. Um, trying to design better typefaces now than before. Uh, since the platforms allow them, allow us to do, trying to learn and understand how to do great design for all these complex steps. Some, some of them need um, rules. Some of them need new formulas. Some of the formulas that we use for Latin may have to be adopted for this script. So those are areas that I'm trying to research and learn into. Well, I hope that uh, was interesting enough, a story for you. <laughs> and I look forward to questions. Thank you. That was a really great um, narration on how you began and uh, really well composed. I, and, uh, in fact, actually, the, uh, the, the Iban script that you referred to was actually one of my students, uh, and she was designing an Iban script. Uh, I didn't know. In fact, that was the first time I came to know that uh, the Iban language actually had its own script. So I was really, uh, you know, uh, happy to know it and I immediately you know pointed her to you <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and she found uh, you know the laser Iban uh, what do you call it Dr. Philip yeah. in yeah. Uh, Sarawak as well because she's from Sarawak yeah. um, and it was really nice that uh, that I mean I think it would be really cool to have the script on phones as well yes. and this would encourage the use of that script uh, among the yes. younger generations as well uh, and probably even prompt people to teach it as well right. so that would be awesome Okay, without further ado, let me ask the first question. So, what is the most difficult script that you have designed? Ah, okay. Um, you see, difficulty comes from, I, I, the, the scripts that I work on um, are in general called complex scripts. Of course, people who speak those scripts don't like to be called uh, complex, but, you know, technically, the technical term is complex script because they need more um, components to form a character, right? That's why they call it uh, complex. Um, difficulty comes from two angles. One is to design, that means to draw those letters. And the second one is to engineer them to so, so that they sit on each other properly, right? Unlike English, what you type is what you get. But these languages have many more characters than what the keyboard accommodates or um, what is what appears in your eyes? Like, for example, Khmer or Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar, for example, is a beautiful script. It's a lot of circles. It's so easy to draw. It's so easy to design uh, Myanmar, but it's a nightmare to get it to work um, correctly. You know, the marks should go in the correct place. What if there is a uh, encompassing mark that actually has to wrap around a few characters? All that is engineering work. That's very challenging. And there are some languages where the engineering is very simple. Uh, uh, 
uh, the, uh, you know, Singhala, for example, is a very simple, uh, in terms of engineering, very similar to Tamil, but the character design can be a bit complex. You know, there, there are a lot more strokes to do. So difficulty and in terms of engineering, my most difficult one probably was Myanmar. Um, in terms of design, I think my most difficult one was probably Odisha because it's so far away. I've not seen handwritten manuscripts. I've not seen uh, people who write those languages. So a lot of a lot of a lot of imagination. So that was uh, one of the most difficult scripts I had in design. Okay, on a on a question of cultural identity, do you think a culture has a stronger cultural identity if it has its own script? Absolutely, I I definitely think so. Um, uh, okay, I think the expression is different. It's, it's like the nuance of the language, right? The pronunciation will change if you change the right written form. Um, I'm sure if you go back a few decades uh, in Malaysia and speak to people who spoke Malay at the time when they were using the Arabic script, the sound of the language will be different from what you hear today. Okay? So I think that that nuance is lost when you when you lose the script. And so too, I suppose, uh, if you go back even further, mm. uh, you would probably find that uh, or rather Arabic or the Jawi script was Absolutely. not not the this script that was used by yes. uh, the Malay language, but rather yes. there yeah. were other scripts uh, that were, were, were used. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, okay, so now we, we know what was the most difficult ones that you have designed. And so now you have designed many vernacular typefaces. Mm -hmm. Which is your favorite and why? Mm -hmm. My favorite uh, in terms of design, um, I think Gujarati. I like it because uh, it, it, you know, there's a, there's there's a uniformity across all the the letter forms. Um, uh, you don't have you know what we call stroke densities. You know, like congestion of strokes in in some parts, and then distribution in other parts. It's quite evenly uh, distributed. Um, it's not easy to do. It, it's a, it does. I mean, you need a lot of forms. Um, what I like most about is the hook. You know, there, there is the, the inherent um, vertical stroke in every consonant. Mm -hmm. And when you write that uh, independently, there's a hook. But when you add a vowel sign to it, the hook disappears and the vowel attaches to it. Uh -huh. there's, okay. there's, there's a form of beauty in there. You know, yeah. And I like that a lot. Okay. I think I know. I, mean, I think for the audience, it might be a bit difficult to, for them to understand that part of it. Uh, but I've, because I've seen it happen, uh, yeah. it, it, it's really interesting. I get it. Um, there is a question from the floor, and mm. we'd like to address. So I'm just going to hand it over to Jinchi so that she can ask the question. Okay, thank you, Vinod. Um, actually, we have three questions, um, mm -hmm. and the first question is kind of similar to Vinod's first question, but there's an extension of it. So this is from Narayanan. And I will just read the whole question so sure. that you know the whole whole thing. Okay. What so, is the question in? Uh, <laughs> the, the, the challenging one that you've worked on, I think you gave the answer. Okay. <laughs> and and was there any you had trouble with because it was barely spoken? So uh -huh. yeah. uh, well, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> um, like what I told you, not the one that I struggled the most was with Oriya. Um, it, uh, it it had, it had a lot of uh, letters that you know a lot of what you call conjuncts. You know, it it had its own challenges when you actually merge two consonants together. There are some rules that you need to follow. Understanding the technicality of it is not uh, was not the problem. It's like positioning them. One needs to be smaller. One needs to be bigger. Um, it was an interesting idea, but I didn't see because there were no Odisha speaking. Uh, you can't find them in Malaysia, for instance. Um, probably if I go there and then uh, see myself. Um, one of my favorite things I do when I go to every city is to look at signboards and look at sign paintings and how they do that. I'm sure every typographer does that, right? Yeah. So, they know, they know right? Like Bengali, for instance, you can find it anywhere in Malaysia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Khmer, you can find. Maria, uh, Myanmar, you can find. There's a community that you can go to. But Odisha, there wasn't. So. That was very challenging uh, for me. Uh, okay. But today, I think it will. I mean, if I have to do that again today, it won't won't be much of a problem because a lot of 
forums out there that you can actually ask people to send you stuff. Okay. I hope that answers um, the question uh, by um, Narayanan. Yeah. Thank you for asking the question. Um, I think we have actually one question. The second question is actually by Emma Hardy from Emma Hardy. And um, I think you also have answered that because the moment we received the question, we not asked it, which was out of all the scripts you have worked on, which one is your favorite and why? Yeah. Yeah. Emma, have you been looking into our question bank? <laughs> <laughs> well, another, right. since, since she asked the same question, another script yeah. that, that I'm also very, and they also like a lot is, is the Bengali script. You know, you, if you look at all the letters, they, they all like, they are like cut out of triangles, you know. They, they, they. And um, Bengali has a little um, uh, different uh, uh, characteristics um, than the other Indian languages because of the way it is written. You know? If you have seen Hindi or any Sanskrit uh, written in Devanagari script, for example, I don't know if people would have seen it, but a lot of the Indian scripts, the Northern Indian scripts, you they will write and then they will join a word with a with a headline. All right, a, head, a headline draw, uh, joins the letters of a word, and then you see headlines drawing letters. But in Bengali, the headline is drawn as you write each character. Mm. So it's so interesting, um, and that's one of those things that I want to research on. I was, I was, I was just thinking, why is that in some some countries, like for example, in the case of uh, of India, there's so many different languages and there's so many different scripts. Mm. But then, and then you have places like in China, you have just one script. Oh, that's political. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was an action. That was a, that was a proactive action. Yeah. Okay. There's somebody who came and said, hey, this is the only script we're going to use, bingo. And that's a law. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was no such law in India. Right. On. But, you know, having said that, if you actually study um, uh, the, the evolution of the scripts, they all actually evolved, uh, evolved from a common ancestor. All of the Indian scripts evolved from a common ancestor, and the okay. shapes changed according to the medium that they were using to write. Mm -hmm. right? Some wrote on, on leaves, some wrote on paper. Uh, there was no paper at that time. Some wrote on farm script, farm manuscript. Uh, um, vellum, some wrote right. on copper plates, some wrote okay. on the walls. So it depends, on, depending on the medium, that the form changed. OK. So does being a software engineer give you an added advantage in the discipline of typeface design? Uh, some people think it's a disadvantage. I'll tell you a story. There was this monarchy in the US. <clears throat> they were trying to produce a book uh, that was translated from, uh, and the original book was in English. They translated it in Tamil, and they wanted to print a book. They got to know my contact, and they wrote to me and says, can you recommend, that we, we use a Mac. Can you recommend a Tamil font that works on a Mac? And I told him that, hell, well, the Tamil Mac comes with a Tamil font that I designed. And I was like so proud of it. Right? I mean, that's how many million people in the world use Macs. Mm. And they all have my font installed in their devices. And then he replied and says, anything but that font. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> yeah, and then I said, why do you say so? I said, because this looks exactly like the way a software designer would design. <laughs> right. So okay. I think a yeah, software engineer, I, I was focusing a lot on, uh, you know, measured widths, you know, measured uh, uh, distances, measured space, measured thickness. Um, well, now after all these years and having gone through a proper training on typeface design, <laughs> I think it's hundred percent visual now. Mm. The the O needs to overshoot. Um, the, the 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 x height, right? Mm -hmm. So that should be an undershoot on the on the baseline. Mm -hmm. When I first designed it, they all sat exactly on the baseline. I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 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 in in from your view, you probably think there's more of a disadvantage rather than an advantage. No, I think it's just that once you learn the art, um, mm -hmm. then then it becomes an advantage because you can you can use both skills. Um, you know, to for your purpose. And, yeah. And so when I design now, I know how this is going to be engineered, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are very few people on the planet who can design and engineer together. Right? Correct. Which is so, why I asked the question. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. Definitely with with software background uh, and having learned 
the design process with some mm -hmm. real top-notch uh, gurus uh, on the, in the industry. So uh, that's actually clearly the advantage. Okay, so increasingly we are seeing brands developing their own typefaces to strengthen their visual identity, uh, yes. grabbing one such local company. Yes. Uh, in your view, do you think that typeface design has now uh, has has now be, uh, become an essential component uh, in a brand's identity system? I think it's more ha it's happening more now uh, than before. I'll, I'll give you an, another simple example. Um, you know, there are two families of typefaces that are designed um, for all these languages, and and you, know, you can find all of them in macOS and some of them in iOS, and all of them needed a matching Latin typeface, right? So I quickly hacked together something that it's like a serif, but without a serif. You know, you have like the contrast, but yeah. with no serifs, because mm. then there's no such thing as serifs for Indian languages. So, mm, so, mm. so I so that kind of matched my design and served the purpose. I didn't bother uh, too much about optimizing the, the, the Latin pieces. But I get so many emails now asking me if I want to sell the fonts. All right. Because they want to use that for their branding logo because they find it very unique. Um, it's very different from all the other typefaces that, is, that they see. When they see uh, thickness and thin, I mean, stroke, stroke variations, mm, contrast, uh, contrast mm. uh, it usually comes with a serif. But this time, hey, there's, there's something that I can use this for a unique identity. So I see this happening uh, uh, today. And yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a, a direction. And, I yeah. Um, I will be passing it over again to Jinchi because I think we have another question from the floor. Yep. Yep, we do. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Narayanan again. Hmm. So some languages are dying due to economic state of people. Mm -hmm. And have less access to technology. Yeah. So how to how do you bridge this gap with your efforts in preserving language? Yeah, definitely. Um, as as there are languages that are disadvantaged because of that, there are also there is also a, a, a community of designers and developers who are addressing that need. You know that uh, which is the. Uh, which is a welcome change we see. Uh, Google's Noto uh, project, for example, um, you know what Noto stands for, right? It's no tofu. <laughs> when a character is missing in a font, it's usually uh, represented by a square. They call that a tofu. Right? <laughs> so they don't want to see tofus anymore. That's how the Noto, Noto font uh, came about. So they want to be able to uh, render every script, every character that is encoded in the Unicode standard. So I think. Um, most of the languages, and for, if not all of the languages that are spoken today, are already covered in the Unicode standard, which means they will be covered by Noto. And the scripts that have gone extinct are also covered. Uh, for example, Granta, for example, I just did one, and Granta is already covered. And the, as long as it is covered by any of these uh, universal typefaces, they will appear on devices. The next challenge is to tell the people that, hey, you can actually use your script on your device. Provide them a keyboard, provide them an input mechanism. If not a keyboard, at least like a voice recognition system that will recognize that and translate the text. Um, today, I think the biggest challenge is to find the usage. Um, technology is not as big a barrier as it was um, probably about two decades ago. OK. So Jinji, do we have another one? Uh, nope, I think that, that other okay. question is so, answered. So Thank let you. me just ask this particular question. Um, what's the youngest uh, a, a script out there right now? Because I'm, I'm kind of fascinated that, you know, we all know of scripts that have been created and have been used uh, over, I mean, and we don't know who created it or maybe we do, yeah. but so how does, I mean, is there, is there a time where, is it feasible and practical to develop a completely different script mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. right? For a lang for a language that exists mm -hmm. that probably uses a script or borrows a script. For example, yeah. maybe the Malay language uh, we borrow either the Roman letter, uh, I mean the Latin Latin text, or we uh, it's 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 Jawi, which is uh, a, a script that comes from the Arabic, uh, you know, text with maybe one or two letters more. Mm -hmm. So is it possible? And is there anybody actually working? 
to create scripts for languages that already exist, but don't have, you know, where do you get the point? The most modern, uh, the, uh, the newest script that I've come across um, is the Iban script. I, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I've read some history of that. I think it doesn't go back uh, very long. Um, I think they, Iban did have a script. I think they lost it uh, for some reason, and somebody tried to reinvent it um, and by putting together. And now from 70-something letters, they reduced it, and you know they have, they have come to some, some understanding. That's a, number of 50, uh, that's a number of characters that have. That's, a, that's the newest that, I, uh, that, I've, that I've known. Um, newer than that, there is another script that is newer than that, and all of us are familiar with it. Emoji. <laughs> true enough. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. Okay, that's cool. Um, I'm just wondering whether I should get political now. Hang on. Um, so okay, the, last year we had um, last year cut was introduced by our former education minister uh, in the yeah. Batum Layu syllabus. Yeah. Um, there was vociferous objections raised by local NGOs and members of political party yeah. uh, single-handed this single-handedly caused the revival and increased popularity of Jawi uh, of the Jawi script absolutely i got i got so excited because uh, more people were excited about Jawi <laughs> yeah. so in, in your view and yeah. as a proponent of preserving v vernacular right. scripts right should Jawi should Jawi as a script be taught in national and vernacular type schools Right. What is your stand on it? Okay. No, the like the outburst, and you like, you correctly pointed out the out outburst was purely political. Um, in my this is my view, and in, in, uh, I don't want to sound political. I don't want uh, to add any political element to this answer. Mm. Uh, I think Jawi should be there. Um, it is still one of the official two official languages for Malay, right? To, you know, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, but I think if I legally write a, a letter in Jawi and send it to the government, they are obliged to re, uh, to reply, because it is still considered an official script for for the Malay language, right? Though the preferred one is now uh, Latin or Rumi uh, versus versus Jawi script. Uh, you know, even even if you don't want to get into the into the uh, standard official status. It is a known fact that Malay was written, uh, and it's still being written in the Javi script, right? So if anybody is claiming to know the Malay language or studying or is, uh, is doing studying a, uh, 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 the Malay language, at least in the formal um, uh, manner, they need to know that this language was written in the Javi script before, right? And this is how the script looks like. Looks like you know you don't have to learn how to write it. But at least to understand that this is how the script looks like. It's a script that appears in our currency. It's a script that you will see in the mosques. You will see in some road signs. You know, at least to recognize that oh, this is Malay that's written in Jawi. So, I I think it should be there. Um, but whether you should make it compulsory, whether you should introduce this into all schools, into all subjects, I that's. I don't know. I mean, I'll leave the academics to figure it out. Um, but as a, as a as an individual, I think you know, passion as an individual who's passionate about languages. You, if you want to understand the history um, or the full context of the language, you probably need to understand that this language is written in, uh, was written in many uh, multiple scripts. Okay. Yeah. So, in many countries and states in the world today. India comes to mind, uh, there is a growing trend of states and national governments mandating that only national languages and scripts are used and displayed on shop signboards or billboards. So is this a conflict you know, in identity? For example, if you go to a Chinese co uh, coffee shop that's based in Malacca, right, and uh, they already have, uh, you know, for decades, right, uh, or I'm sorry, not even decades, for centuries probably, uh, you know, these Chinese letters that are large. Uh, so what my, my question is, is simply is that, you know, what, what, what's the motivation here, uh, mm. you know, to, 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 to make this change? What's yeah. the problem? 
see, that's what, this is what I was trying to talk about in, in earlier part of my talk. And, you know, um, authorities try to put regulations and assimilate people together and, you know, try to create a uniform identity. And in that context, you start losing uh, um, the identity of the script or the language. Um, the, you know, the, the answer is a lot uh, to do with politics. Um, uh, you know, you, we, there are many ways we can achieve national identity, not necessarily enforcing things, you know. Um, uh, for the coffee shop, for example, you know, I may not even, um, you know, uh, walk into a coffee shop that doesn't have, a kopitiam shop that doesn't have Chinese wording. You know, I may not even see it as a genuine copy damn shop. You know, uh, the tables must be of a certain material. The chairs must be of a certain design. Only then it's considered an authentic copy damn shop. You know, likewise the signboard. Why are we teaching people identities? Why uh, Why are we teaching people logo creation? Why Why is there corporate identity? That's because there's a signature attached to um, the idea, right? So. Um, Signboards, are, that's the front end, that's a facade, you know, that's what you first see and that's where you draw your first impression about the place or the, or the premise that, that, that you're going to visit, right? Um, and I believe that that should be in the freedom. I mean, of course, there are regulations, you need to cater to everybody else's um, uh, need and people, everybody know, must know what it is, but not at the expense of um, having to change the original identity uh, of that place. I think I'm being, <laughs> I've answered the politically correct. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so we have one more question from the audience and then I will continue uh, in that political vein and last question oh, wow. <laughs> as well. <laughs> nice, nice, you know. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, we have one question from Vani G, okay. Or do you feel that the historical background of the community is important when you engineer the script? Ah, interesting. It's, you know, there's a question I had um, for a long time because a lot of these typeface design courses start, start teaching history of the, of the script. And, you know, I, I think it does play a part. I know I won't, uh, I, I, I'll probably not say that without it, you can't do it, you know. Um, it does play a part, you know, for example, to understand the medium on which the script was written, you know, um, how did they write it? What was the writing tool? What was the instrument that they used to inscribe? You know, where, where do we see this inscription? Um, all that, uh, you know, is bound to the culture of that, of the, of the place, right? Um, I think that kind of gives you, uh, or lends some authenticity to the design. Um, I've always complained about, say, the Tamil script on a Windows machine, not because I designed the Tamil script on the Mac machine, but even before that, it it, it clearly shows that it was not designed by somebody who understood um, the, 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 the uh, Tamil writing system or the Tamil script. It was, it was completely alien, looks very for, uh, foreign to me. But it was, we were forced to use it because that was the only, uh, that was a default script on Windows. That's a different story altogether. But to answer the question, yeah, I think understanding the cultural um, traditions, uh, a little bit of history of, um, of the people and the script uh, does influence uh, the design. And I think it, the, the outcome of that will be a bit more appealing to the native speakers. Great. That was actually a question I was going to ask as well, but uh, <laughs> it was asked. Thank you, audience. <laughs> Okay, so uh, do we have another question or um, should I just continue? I think there's one. Some... Yes, we do, but <laughs> it's I'm very sure. strange. Yeah. No, Vicky, Vicky want to explain what's the source of the question. <laughs> yeah, this is perplexing a little bit now. <laughs> yes, okay, I'll, I'll ask it anyway. It mm. actually came from one of us, but nobody's answering. One of us as in, in the team. <laughs> is okay. It? okay, yes. All right, it says that the, the person who asked the question is Troublemakers Assembly. Anyway. Oh, okay. So, uh, oh, yes. Sherry. Oh, yes. Sherry. Okay, all right. Should be, should be her. Hi, Sherry. Okay. Is there any need or advantage to create visual fonts for languages that are purely oral? Mm. 
Okay, well, this is probably a different, probably not a design related question. Mm. Indian languages, for example, were oral. La the, the writing system came much later, right? In fact, there was one line, I don't know which book this was, there was one line in, I think it was written in Sanskrit, that said the moment you write it down, that language or that slogan is dead. <laughs> Um, it was an orally trans. The, the, the culture was orally transmitting knowledge. There was no writing system, but it came. Of course, writing system came much later, and thankfully now we have uh, written records of um, all those literatures that people talked about. Um, I think writing system is important for records for for uh, future generation. Uh, what if the community suddenly stops speaking the language? We have seen it in in many. Uh, cases uh, where people just stop speaking the language, they get assimilated into the main culture. Um, and without a writing system, there's no record of, um, you know, what what was spoken, what was thought, what was created, what was crafted, you know, um, all the literary composition, the history, everything. Okay, we lose those things. Yeah. Great. In the same way, I should now ask this question. Wow. <laughs> so Malaysia is rich in culture and tradition. There yeah. are factions in Malaysia that yeah. believe for there to be a shared national consciousness, mm -hmm. the young need to mingle and find commonalities. Right. Schools are seen as a place where this shared consciousness can take root. Right. Thus, there are people who propose a reduction of, of focus or support for vernacular schools. Mm. On the flip side, there are factions that believe culture and tradition, which include reading and writing in one's own mother tongue, mm. would be jeopardized if vernacular schools are not supported. Mm. As a proponent of keeping scripts and languages alive, is there a win-win solution mm. that could appease both factions? Mm. And no, if so, if yeah. yes, what would this look like? Yeah. There are definitely win-win situations, but we need to have the will to look at one, right? Um, it is, it, for me, it's the intent, uh, I, intent of the proposal, uh, not so much the content. Right? Mm -hmm. if, if the intent um, clearly says, um, or cl clearly shows that we want to assimilate, we want all these other things to go, then that's definitely a no-go, right? If the intent is like, let's mingle, which means, you know, I can send my children to a Chinese school um, and, and learn all the languages that someone who goes to a Tamil school and they'll learn all the other national school. So it doesn't matter which school you go, you get everything that you want. Um, that requires a it's a much bigger heart, bigger mind. Mm. I need to go beyond all these little things that we argue about on a daily basis. We are not ready for that. <laughs> That's my thought. Nice. <laughs> okay, I think we are we're inching closer to the time uh, that we should end this. So I'm going to ask one last question, uh, and uh, that's provided I can find the damn question. Um, oh yes, <laughs> what advice would you have for young typeface designers? If you right. have any, <laughs> right? Um, I think my advice is to. So, you know, learn to see, learn, learn to see, learn to observe, learn to, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a parallel, right? There was a, there was this very famous writer, Tamil writer who came to Malaysia for a seminar. And during the question and answer, they asked him, what is your advice to young writers? <laughs> All right. I'm actually churying the idea from there. <laughs> so he said, observe, read. Right, you know, uh, look at it. You know, when you're in the front of, a, when you're an, you're an entrance of a school, observe everything. Look at all these little children. Look at how people are going. Look at the cars that are moving past. Look at the guy who's actually parking his bicycle and handing over the bag to this young kid. Look at this mother who is trying to put this, you know, food into this, this Tupperware and giving it to the children. Look at everything. And then you'll know what actually attracts you, what draws you on, what people will like. Um, that was a great insight, you know. And likewise, typeface design. If you look at the nuances of every letter uh, of every script, what what makes um, 
a, a letter in a script unique? What can you bring out um, in, 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 in a particular script that displays its unique beauty? You know? I, was th- I was just talking about the hooks and anchors in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Gujarati, for example, and the triangles in, in uh, Bengali. Bengali yeah? So, you know, I, I, go, I go after all these things. I, I look at all these little, little things. How, how did, even for Latin, how, what, what different variations did they do to serifs? You know, um, what does very high contrast do to a design of a typeface, or appearance of a typeface? How, what, if, what if you reduce the contrast a little bit? You know, make the thick and the thing, the difference between the thick and the thin not so big, not so obvious or conspicuous. What difference does it make, you know? Those are kind of things that, you know, uh, budding designers can look at, you know. Uh, try to observe, try to look. And design for as many scripts as possible. Don't stick to just one family. Um, I think the world needs more designers like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm on a distinct disadvantage there. I'm a coconut. So uh, <laughs> brown on the outside, white on the inside. All I speak is English and write English. <laughs> Okay. Oh, well, maybe I mean, I speak, I speak other languages. I just can't write though. <laughs> okay. Jinji, with that, I'm handing it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Vinod. Those were great questions from, from you, especially also from our audience. It's been very engaging. And I think um, it's been a great, great, great time uh, that we had with um, Mutu. Thank you so much. We understand that you're, you're also very busy yes, with I your own been. schedule and all that. So right. we are very lucky to have you here. We'll right. continue to invite you as well for our We're very happy to, other, yeah. other um, um, events that are coming up. Right. You know, so um, guys, do you want to say anything to Char uh, to to Mutu before we end? Charles, Charles, you're on. Really I'm glad. Thank you. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mutu. I would like to take this opportunity to to thank everyone who is here with us today, and a big big thank you for Mutu for making time for us. We've learned a lot and. Last but not least, my great team, Charles, Bikram, Vinod, thank you guys so much. And everyone, we look forward to seeing you again in our next session, which will be on 13th of November with Izzat Arif. Okay, watch out for more information. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks a lot.